protection of DACA on a daily basis. As of March 5th, 1,000 a day will lose DACA protection. 900 of them are members of the U.S. military. 20,000 of them are school teachers. In my state of Illinois and the city of Chicago, there are 25 of them in medical school who can't apply for a residency if they lose their DACA status. So lives are hanging in the balance of our getting the job done. We've got the time to do it. In a matter of days, literally of days, we can come together and reach an agreement. And when that happens, I think good things will happen in other places, and we'll see some more progress here in Washington. I agree with that, Dick. I very much agree with that. Tom, would you like to say something? Tom Cott. Thank you for inviting us all here, and I'm glad to be here with Democrats and with House members as well. Um, you know, I think on this issue, there's a lack of trust, and has been for many years, a uh, lack of trust between um, Republicans and Democrats, a lack of trust among Republicans, and most fundamentally a lack of trust between the American people uh, and our elected leaders on not delivering a solution for many, many years about some of these problems. Uh, and I hope that this meeting can be the beginning of building trust between our parties, between the chambers, um, because I know for a fact all the Republicans around the table are committed to finding a solution, and I believe all the Democrats are as well. Uh, so I think this is a good first step in building the trust we need for a good bill, Mr. President, that will achieve the objectives that you stated, uh, providing legal protection for the DACA population while also securing our border and ending chain migration and the diversity lottery. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. And Mr. President, thank you very much for having us down here. Uh, I agree with Tom Cotton that the American public are very frustrated with us. One of the reasons they're frustrated with us because we continue to couple things on which uh, we have large agreement with things on which we do not agree. This is a perfect example of that. 86% uh, of the American people in the most recent poll are for uh, ensuring, as you have said, uh, not uh, providing for DACA protected kids to go to a place that they don't know, they didn't grow up in, and it's not their home. Uh, they're Americans. They don't have a piece of paper that says they're Americans, but they're Americans. And it seems to me, Mr. President, if we're going to move ahead in a constructive way, and that we take that on which we agree, pass it. The American public will be pleased with all of us if we do that. Just as in September, you recall, we did uh, the extension of a CR, no drama. We were all for it. Uh, you, uh, the four leaders uh, met, uh, we came uh, to an agreement, and we passed uh, that CR. In my view, we can pass, we can pass uh, the protection in the, what I understand your position is, procedurally it was not done correctly. You then, as Dick has said, challenged us, pass it correctly. If it's put on the floor, Mr. President, I believe it will have uh, the overwhelming majority in both the House and Senator Graham thinks it will have a substantial majority in the United States Senate as well. That, I think, is the first step, Tom, to creating some degree of confidence. Democrats are for security at the borders. I want to state that emphatically. There is not a Democrat that is not for having secure borders. There are obviously differences, however, Mr. President, on how you affect that. Okay. You, you just indicated that yourself. And you indicated this would be a first step, and then we continue uh, to talk as we're talking today about how we best secure the border. There are differences of opinion in, within your party and within our party. So I would urge that we move forward on uh, protecting the DACA uh, protected individuals, young young people, young adults, as you pointed out in one of your statements, who are productive parts of our community, uh, that we protect them and, and get that done. And then, because I think everybody around the table, as you pointed out, is for security, and then the issue is going to be how do we best affect that border security. So I would urge us to move, uh, as, as uh, uh, Senator Durbin has urged us to move, 
on the DACA students. As a matter of fact, the speaker, I think today, but maybe yesterday, said we need to solve the DACA issue and we need to solve it in a way that is permanent, not temporary. And uh, I agree with him on that issue. And interestingly, when you say that, uh, President Obama, when he signed the executive order, actually said he doesn't have the right to do this. And so you do have to go through Congress and you do have to make it permanent. Whether he does, whether he doesn't, let's assume he doesn't. You said it. Uh, and that was a temporary stopgap. I don't think we want that. I think we want to have a permanent solution to this. And I think everybody in this room feels that way and very strongly. What happened, Mr. President, I think, is that the Senate passed a comprehensive immigration bill, as you know. Right. Right. We did not consider it in the House, so we didn't reach those issues. Uh, very frankly, on border security, Mr. McCall, the chairman of the committee, reported out a unanimous uh, security uh, solution, which, which we then included in the bill that we uh, filed on comprehensive immigration reform. So I think we can reach agreement. Well, I also think that after we do DACA, and I really believe we should be able to be successful, uh, I really think we should look in terms of your permanent solution and to the whole situation with immigration. I think a lot of people in this room would agree to that also, but we'll do it in steps. Uh, and most people agree with that, I think, that we'll do it in steps. Even you say, let's do this, and then we go phase two. Kevin, what would you like to say? Well, first, I want to thank you for bringing everybody together. You got the Senate, you got the House, you got both parties. And I like the exchange of ideas. And I think everybody has a point here. The one thing I don't want to have happen here is what I saw in the past. There were former bills that were passed on border security years ago that never got finished. There were immigration bills passed that were right back at the table with the same problem. Let's make a commitment to each one, and most importantly to the American people, that when we get done and come to an agreement, that we're not back at this problem three, four years from now. That's why, yes, we've got to do DACA, and I agree with you 100%. But if we do not do something with the security, if we do not do something with the chain migration, we are fooling each other that we solved a problem. You know how difficult this issue is. So let's collectively, we're here at the table together. I'll be the first one to tell you we're all going to have to give a little, and I'll be the first one willing to. But let's solve the problem, but let's not tell the American public at the end that it's solved when it's not. Well, I think a good starting point would be uh, Bob Goodlatte, who has done a bill, and I understand you're ready to submit it, and you're going to take that, and you'll submit, and they'll negotiate in uh, Congress and the House, and then it goes to the Senate, and they'll negotiate, both Republican and Democrat, but it could be a good way of starting. Now, if anyone has an idea different from that, but I think starting in the House, starting in the House might be good. You're ready. I think you're ready to go. Uh, I would like to add the words uh, merit into any bill that's submitted because I think we should have merit-based immigration like they have in Canada, like they have in Australia. So we have people coming in that have a great track record as opposed to, uh, as opposed to what we're doing now, to be honest with you. But I think merit-based should be absolutely added to any bill, even if it has to do with DACA. That would be added to the things I said. I think it would be popular. I think I can tell you the American public very much wants that. But Bob, where are you with the bill? So uh, tomorrow, Chairman McCall and Congressman McSally and Congressman Labrador, we're the chairman of the two committees and the chairman of the two subcommittees, are going to introduce a bill uh, that uh, addresses the DACA concerns. And let me thank you, Mr. President, both. I was an immigration lawyer before I was elected to Congress. I want to thank you both for campaigning on securing uh, our borders and the interior of our country but also on addressing DACA in a way that makes sense. Don't do it ad hoc, do it through the congressional process. So you've challenged us and we should step up to that challenge and we're going to uh, do it in a bipartisan fashion but we have to put our best uh, foot forward and we're going to do that uh, with this legislation. It's going to address DACA uh, in a permanent way, not uh, a temporary short-term thing. Uh, we're going to address the uh, uh, border enforcement and security and the wall. We're going to address, uh, in Mr. McCall's bill, we're going to address interior enforcement, but not everything that the administration had on its list. Uh, we're going to address uh, chain migration. Uh, we're going to end the visa lottery program. We're going to address sanctuary cities and Kate's Law. We think it is a good bill that will both uh, 
address the two things our speaker told, uh, told us right after you made your decision, which is we have to address uh, the problem we have with the DACA kids being in limbo, as Dick Durbin described it, and I, I agree with that. But we also have to make sure this does not happen again. And Dick, you're, and, and the Democrats are going to have a lot of things that they're not going to agree. You're going to talk to us about it. I just felt that this is something it was long overdue. You'd have a meeting and you'd say, this is what we want. We'd have a meeting. And this, uh, this has been going on for years. And I just, you know, at a certain point, maybe I'll just lock the doors and I won't let anybody <laughs> out until, until they come and agree. Michael, do you have something to say about the bill? Yeah, I've been in Congress for seven terms. I've been trying to get this border secure for seven terms in Congress. I think this is a bipartisan issue. I think DACA is a bipartisan issue. We have an opportunity, I think, before us to get this done for the American people. When it comes to chain migration and the lottery system, we saw two recent terror attacks in New York that were the result of this, I think, failed immigration policy. We'd like to see that fixed uh, for the American people, and along with, as Bob talked about, the sanctuary cities. Now, you and I have talked about this uh, extensively. So we think our bill, our House bill, will be a good starting ground for this negotiation. And I, uh, too, want to commend you for bringing everybody together. I think what we don't want to see happen is for the the, the, these, the conditions for DACA to occur again. Uh, we want to get uh, security done so we don't have to deal with this problem five more years down the road. So thank you, sir. For well, there are so many points of agreement, and a lot of it's common sense, and I really think we're going to come out very well. Uh, David Perdue, do you have something to say? Well, yeah, my observation is that three times in the last 11 years, well-intentioned people, some of whom are in this room, attempted to do what we're starting to try to do today, and we failed. And I think the difference is, is their mission creep ended up in an effort that became too comprehensive. And so today, my encouragement for all of us is to do what Dick has been trying to do and talks about uh, repeatedly, and that is to limit the scope of this. And I like the idea that both sides have pressure to solve the DACA issue. But I think the bigger issue here is not just the DACA issue, but what can we do to start the path to the steps that solve this immigration problem? for several reasons. There are social issues, there are political issues, there are economic issues about our workforce that have to be addressed. But limiting this to the legal immigration side and combining the balance between various solutions on DACA, Dreamers if it gets in the conversation, as well as border security and chain migration. I think therein lies the balance of a good deal that can be done. And I don't. Th I agree with Dick, I don't think it's going to take long to get it done if we just lock ourselves in a room and made it happen. I think you're right. I think it can be done uh, very quickly. Would anybody have anything to say prior to the press leaving? Anybody? Mr. President, I just have one comment. Yes. Uh, Senator Durbin mentioned that lives are hanging in the balance. As we come up on the January 19th deadline, the lives that are hanging in the balance are those of our military that are needing the equipment and the funding and everything they need in order to keep us safe. And we should not be playing politics on this issue uh, to stop our military from getting the funding that they need. I think we have the right people in the room to solve this issue. The deadline is March 5th. Let's roll up our sleeves and work together on this. But those who need us right now, before the January 19th deadline, is our military. And let's not play politics with that. Let's give them what they need to keep us safe. Okay, good. I think a lot of people would agree with that. We need our military. I can't say more than ever before. We had wars, right, Lindsay? We had a lot of other areas and times, but uh, we need our military desperately. Our military has been very depleted. We're rebuilding and we're building it up quickly and we're negotiating much better deals with your purveyors and with your manufacturers and with your equipment makers much better than it was before. I look at, I look at boats that started off at $1.5 billion and they're up to $18 billion and they're still not finished. Uh, in this case, a particular aircraft carrier, I think it's outrageous. So we're, uh, we're very much agreeing with you on that, Martha. Mr. Would anybody President, like to say I, I, yes, Denny, I, I, go I ahead. I want to follow up on that. Uh, there are no, no Democrats that don't want to make sure that the military is funded properly. Um, and over the last four years, we had an agreement between Mr. Ryan and Senator Murray, Speaker Ryan, and, uh, that we would, we understand that our military is critically important, but we also understand that are domestic uh, issues, whether it's education, whether it's health care, whether it's the environment, whether it's transportation and infrastructure, they're important as well. And both the defense and non-defense sides of the budget are hurt when you have a CR because they cannot plan and they cannot let contracts if they don't have any money to do so. 
so that, uh, very frankly, uh, I think uh, Ms. McSally is correct, but what we ought to have done over the last uh, six months, uh, particularly when we did the September and we gave 90 days, is to reach some agreement on what the caps are going to be. The Murray-Ryan uh, agreements were parity. Uh, we believe that's very important. So we can get to where we should get uh, and want to get there, uh, but uh, we ought to have an agreement based upon what the, the last two... But, Steny, we do have to take politics out of the military. We need that military. You know, all the other things we talk about, we're not going to be here if we don't have the right military. And we need our military, and we need it stronger than ever before, and we're ready to do it. But we have to take politics out of the military. One thing that I think we can really get along with on a bipartisan basis, and maybe I'm stronger in this than a lot of the people on the Republican side, but I will tell you we have great support from the Republicans, is infrastructure. I think we can do a great infrastructure bill. I think we're going to have a lot of support from both sides, and I'd like to get it done as quickly as possible. Yes, John? Mr. President, I too want to thank you for getting us together. You made the point last week when Republicans were meeting with you that uh, why are we continuing to have uh, these meetings just among ourselves when what we need to do to get to a solution is to meet as we are today, as you insisted, on a bipartisan basis. But part of my job is to count votes in the Senate. And as you know, we hosted us, uh, the leadership at uh, Camp David this weekend. Um, I believe both the Speaker and um, Majority Leader McConnell made crystal clear that they would not, they would not uh, proceed with a bill on the floor of the Senate or the House unless it had your support, unless you would sign it. So that's, uh, I think, uh, the picture that we need to be looking through, the lens we need to be looking through is not only what can we agree to among ourselves on a bipartisan basis, but what will you sign into yeah. law? Because we all want to get to a solution here and we realize the clock is ticking. But I think that, for me, frames the issue uh, about as well as I can. Thank you. Very well said. And, uh, you know, one of the reasons I'm here, Chuck, so importantly, is exactly that. I mean, normally you wouldn't have a president coming to this meeting. Normally, frankly, you'd have Democrats, Republicans, and maybe nothing would get done. Uh, you know, our system lends itself to not getting things done. And I, I hear so much about earmarks, the old earmark system, how there was a great friendliness when you had earmarks. But of course, they had other problems with earmarks. But maybe all of you should start thinking about going back to a form of earmarks, because yeah. this system, <laughs> this system, <laughs> no, well, you should do it. And I'm there with you, because this, of, this system really lends itself to not getting along. It lends itself to hostility and anger, and they hate the Republicans, and they hate the Democrats. And, you know, in the old days of earmarks, you can say what you want about certain presidents and others, where they all talk about they went out to dinner at night, and they all got along, and they passed bills. That was an earmark system. And maybe we should think about it, and we have to put better controls, because it got a little bit out of hand, but maybe that brings people together. Because our system right now, the way it's set up, will never bring people together. Now, I think we're going to get this done, DACA. I think we're going to get, I hope we're going to get infrastructure done in the same way. But I think you should look at a form of earmarks. I see Lindsay nodding very happily, yes. But, but a, lot, a lot of the pros are saying that if you want to get along and if you want to get this country really rolling again, you have to look at a different form because this is obviously out of control. The levels of hatred, and I'm not talking about Trump, I'm talking you go back throughout the eight years of Obama and you go before that, the animosity and the hatred between Republicans and Democrats. I mean, I remember when I used to go out in Washington and I'd see Democrats having dinner with Republicans and they were best friends and everybody got along. You don't see that too much anymore, I hate no due respect. You really don't see that. When was the last time you took a Republican out there? Why don't you guys go out and have dinner tonight? <laughs> but, but you don't see it. So maybe, and very importantly, totally different from this meeting, because we're going to get DACA done. I hope we're going to get DACA done, and we're going to all try very hard. But maybe you should start bringing back a concept of earmarks. It's going to bring you together. You're going to do it honestly. You're going to get rid of the problems that the other system had, and it did have some problems. But one thing it did is it brought everyone together. And this country has to be brought together. Okay? Thank you. Yes, Lindsay? Well, uh, at 6.40, I'm going to go to Menendez's office, and he's taking me to dinner. <laughs> wow. 
And he's buying. It sounds like fun. And he didn't know that, but he's buying. We're going to board and you're all welcome to come. <laughs> No, I, I think we can I usually get bipartisan agreement when the other guy buys. I, I think it's a very important thing because our system is designed right now that everybody should hate each other. And we can't have that. You know, we have a great country. We have a country that's doing very well uh, in many respects. Uh, we're just hitting a new high on the stock market again. Now, that means jobs. I, look at the sto I don't look at the stocks. I look at the jobs. I look at the 401ks. I look at what's happening where police come up to me and they say, thank you, you make, you're making me look like a financial genius. Literally, meaning about them. And their wives never thought that was possible, right? <laughs> no, the country, the country is doing well in so many ways, but there's such divisiveness, such division. And I really believe we can solve that. I think this system is a very bad system in terms of getting together. And I'm going to leave it up to you, but I really believe you can do something to bring it together. Yeah? And other than going to dinner with Bob, I've been doing this for 10 years. I don't think I've seen a better chance to get it done than I do right now because of you. John's right. I'm not going to support a bill if you don't support it. I've had my head beat out a bunch. I'm still standing. I'm Lindsey Gramnesty, Lindsey Gomez, you name every name you want to give to me, it's been assigned to me. And I'm still standing. The people of South Carolina want a result. How could I get elected? I've been for a pathway to citizenship for 11 million people because I have no animosity toward them. I don't want crooks. I don't want bad hombres. I want to get a merit-based immigration system to make sure we can succeed in the 21st century. I'm willing to be more than fair to the 11 million. I just don't want to do this every 20 years. Now, we made the decision, Mr. President, not to do it comprehensively. I think that's a smart decision, but a hard decision. We passed three comprehensive bills out of the Senate with over 65 votes. They go to the House and die, and I'm not being disparaging to my House colleagues. This is tough politics if you're a Republican House member turning on the radio. To my Democratic friends, thanks for coming. The resist movement hates this guy. They don't want him to be successful at all. You turn on Fox News and I can hear the drumbeat coming. Right-wing radio and TV talk show hosts are going to beat the crap out of us because it's going to be amnesty all over again. I don't know if the Republican and Democratic Party can define love, but I think what we can do is do what the American people want us to do. 62% of the Trump voters support a pathway to citizenship for the DACA kids if you have strong borders. You have created an opportunity here, Mr. President, and you need to close the deal. Thank you, Lindsay. You know, uh, it's very interesting because I do have people that are, let's just to use a very common term, very far right and very far left. Uh, they're very unhappy about what we're doing, but I really don't believe they have to be because I really think this sells itself. And, you know, when you talk about comprehensive immigration reform, which is where I would like to get to eventually, if we do the right bill here, we are not very far away. You know, we've done most of it. If you want to know the truth, Dick, if we do this properly, DACA, you're not so far away from comprehensive immigration reform. And if you want to take it that further step, I'll take the heat. I don't care. I don't care. I'll take all the heat you want to give me. And I'll take the heat off both the Democrats and the Republicans. My whole life has been heat. <laughs> I like heat in a certain way. But I will. I mean, you are somewhat more traditional politicians than me. Two and a half years ago, I was never thinking in terms of politics. Now I'm a politician. You people have been doing it, many of you, all your lives. I'll take all the heat you want. But you are not that far away from comprehensive immigration reform. And if you wanted to go that final step, I think you should do it. And if you want to study earmarks to bring us all together so we all get together and do something, I think you should study it. Chuck, did you have something to say? I'd like to talk about the reality of the whole situation and take off from what Cornyn and Graham have said of the necessity of you working with us, and you're doing that by having this meeting and other meetings as well. But we've always talked in the United States Senate about the necessity of getting 60 votes, and that's pretty darn tough. But if we would write a bill that you don't like and you veto it, we're talking about a 67 vote threshold, right. two thirds in the United States Senate. So that's the reality of, of uh, negotiating in good faith and getting something you can sign. The second reality is the March 5th date that's coming up. Because uh, if we don't do some good faith negotiation and make process, progress and get a bill on the floor of the United States Senate, 
our leader is going to have to bring up either the House bill or the bill that uh, some of us has introduced in the United States Senate, and we're going to have a vote on it. And those people that don't want to vote to legalize DACA kids uh, are, are, the, are going to have to sh explain why that they haven't wanted to protect the vulnerable people that we're all here talking about. We're talking about everything except uh, doing something for the DACA kids. You know, I would vote for a path to c citizenship, which isn't very easy for me, but I would do it uh, just as an effort. But there's certain things that you've got, we've got to guarantee that way, we're going to do. That, that's going to be brought up. I really believe that will be brought up as part of what we're talking about at some point. It's an incentive for people to do a good job, if you want to know the truth. That whole path is an incentive for people, and they're not all kids. I mean, you know, we're, we were, used to talk about kids. They're not really kids. You have them 39, 40 years old in some cases. But it would be an incentive for people to work hard, do a good job. So, you know, that could very well be brought we're up. Talking about legalizing people here that didn't break the law because their parents who broke the law brought them here. Yes. And we ought to be talking about what we can do for the people that had no fault of their own and get the job done and not worry about a lot of other things that we're, we're involved in. And that means that we've got to make sure that we tell the American people when we're taking this step that we're doing something that all the people agree to, you know. Mr. President, uh, let me just say, I think Dick and I agree with what Chuck Grassley just said. <laughs> it's uh, hard to believe. When was the last time that happened? <laughs> we need to take care of these DACA kids, and, and we all agree on that. 86% of the American public agrees on that. With all due respect, Bob and uh, Mike uh, and Lindsay, uh, th there are some things that you're proposing that are going to be very controversial and will be an impediment to agreement. But you're going to negotiate those things. You're going to sit down. You're going to say, listen, we can't agree here. We, we'll give you half of that. We're going to, you're going to negotiate Mr. those President, things. Comprehensive means comprehensive. No, we're not talking about comprehensive. No, 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 now no, we're talking no, about no, we are. We are talking about comprehensive. Because if you want many, to go there, it's OK, because you're not that Mr. far President, away. Mr. President, many of the things that are mentioned ought to be a part of the negotiations regarding comprehensive immigration well, reform. Then, if you want and, to take it a step further, you may, I'm going to have to rely on you. I think what you you may have, complicate it, and you may delay DACA somewhat. I don't want to do that. You, you know, said at the outset we need to phase this. I think the first phase is with Chuck and Steny and I have mentioned others as well. Mm -hmm. We have a deadline looming and a lot of lives hanging. Uh, we can agree on some very fundamental and important things together on border security, on chain, uh, on the future of diversity visas. Comprehensive though, I worked on it for six months with Michael Bennett and uh, a number of Bob Menendez. Uh, and Schumer and McCain and Jeff Flake and it took us six months to put it together. We don't have six months for the DACA. We're not talking about communism. Take a look at our bill. Yeah. Well, you mentioned a number of factors that are going to be controversial, as Cindy has mentioned. But it's you're going to negotiate. Dick, you're going to negotiate. And maybe we'll agree and maybe we won't. I mean, you know, it's possible we're not going to agree with you and it's possible we are, but there should be no reason for us not to get this done. And Chuck, I will say, when this group comes back, hopefully with an agreement, this group and others from the Senate, from the House, comes back with an agreement, I'm signing it. I mean, I will be signing it. I'm not going to say, oh, gee, I want this or I want that. I'll be signing it because I have a lot of confidence in the people in this room that you're going to come out with something really good. Uh, Senator, would you like to say something? Diane? I would. Um, as you know, we tried for comprehensive immigration reform in the Senate. It was on the floor, there were a number of amendments, it got a lot of attention in the Judiciary Committee, and then the House didn't take it up. Um, I, I think there needs to be a willingness on both sides, um, and I think, and I don't know how you would feel about this, but I'd like to ask the question, what about a clean DACA bill now, uh, with a commitment that we go into a comprehensive immigration reform procedure like we did back, oh, I remember when Kennedy was here. And, well, it was really a major, major effort, and uh, it was a great disappointment that it went nowhere. nowhere. Uh, I have no problem. I, I think that's basically what Dick is saying. We're going to come out with DACA, we're going to do DACA, and then we can start immediately on the phase two, which would be comprehensive. Would be agreeable Mr. To yeah, I would like, I would like to do that. Go ahead. I think a lot of people would like to see that. But I think we have to do DACA first. Mr. President, you, you need to be clear, though. I, I, th I think what Senator Feinstein's asking here, when we talk about just DACA, we don't want to be back here two years later. You have to have security, as the Secretary would tell you. But I think that's what she's saying. I think 
Well, I, no, no, I think she's saying something Stand different. Mr. President, I'm saying. I'm thinking you're saying DACA without security. Are you talking about security as well? Well, I, I think if, if we have some meaningful, comprehensive uh, in, uh, immigration reform, that's really where the security goes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if we could get the DACA yeah. bill, because March is coming, and people are losing their status every day. But, but oh, let's be honest with you. Security was voted on just a few years ago. And, and no disrespect, there's people in the room on the other side of the aisle who voted for it. Mm -hmm. uh, if I recall, Senator Clinton voted for it. So I don't think that's comprehensive. I think that's dealing with DACA at the same time. I think that's really what the president's making. It's kind of like three pillars. DACA, because we all, we're all in the room want to do it. Border security, so we're not back out here, and chain migration. It's just three items, and then everything else that's comprehensive is kind of moved to the side. So I believe yeah, when the president lottery, talks about DACA, and the lottery. And lottery. And that I is think what you should add merit. I mean, if you can, add merit based. <laughs> no, I, I don't think, I, I don't know who's going to argue with merit based. Who, had, who can argue with, with merit based? And the, the, Diane, the, the go the ahead. Do you really think that there can be agreement? We can do it quickly. Quickly. Diane, go ahead. To get DACA passed in time. I w wanted to ask uh, Mr. McCarthy a question. Oh, yeah. Do you really think there can be agreement on those three difficult <laughs> subjects you raise in time to get DACA passed and effective? So Yes, because you, you have heard from Leader McConnell and uh, Speaker Ryan who said they will put the bill onto the floor if the President agrees to it. And us getting to the room, I haven't seen us be this close and having this discussion in quite a few years of the whole last four years. So I think, yes, we can make this happen. We all know it. We've done it before. Look, you and I spent a long time. We did probably one of the most difficult things to do in California, water. And I believe we can get there and we can just keep working uh, each day on this. Mr. President, I, I think what we're all saying is we'll do DACA. And we can certainly start comprehensive immigration reform the following afternoon, okay? We'll take an hour off and then we'll start. But I, I do believe that. Because once we get DACA done, if it's done properly with, you know, security and everything else, if it's done properly, we have taken a big chunk of comprehensive out of the negotiation. And I don't think it's going to be that complicated. Yes. We have to be very clear, though. In my opinion, we'll be right back here either five years, 30 years, whatever. But this... The chain migration is so insidious. It is the fundamental flaw in the immigration policy of the United States. If any conversation about DACA is being held without that consideration, I agree with border security as well, but any conversation about that is not going to go anywhere in the United States Senate. And if we think we're going to divide one side versus the other, that's just not going to happen on this issue. David, I think chain migration has taken a very big hit over the last six months. You know, people are seeing what's happening. People, for instance, the the man on the west side highway that killed the people and so badly wounded. You know, it's incredible when they talk about wounded. They don't say that arms are off and legs are off. One person lost two legs. You know, nobody talks about it. They said eight died, but they don't talk about the 12 people that have no legs, no arms, and all of the things. So I'm talking about everybody. I really believe that uh, when you talk about the subject that we're all mentioning right now, I think they had uh, how many people came in? 22 to 24 people came in through him. He was a killer. He was a guy who ran over eight, many people, eight died. 10 to 12 are really badly in, you know, injured. So I really think that uh, a lot of people are going to agree with us now on that subject. I really don't see there's a big... 70% of Americans want the immigration policy to be the family, yeah. the nuclear family and the worker. 70%. The change migration though, has taken a very big hit in the last year with what's happening. I mean, you're looking at these killers, whether you like or not, we're looking at these killers, and then you see 18 people came in, 22 people came in, 30 people came in with this one person that just killed a lot of people. I really don't believe there are a lot of Democrats that are going to be supporting chain migration anymore. Should we have the Homeland Security Secretary? Yes. yes. You know, just just yes, on border security. I just want to try to make sure we're all linking. The, the reason that border security is so important to have as part of this discussion 
is that it doesn't solve the problem if we can apprehend people, but we can't remove them. So we need the wall system, which is some physical infrastructure, as the, the president described, personnel and technology, but we have to close those legal, legal loopholes because the effect of that is this incredible pull up from Central America that just continues to exacerbate the problem. So border security has to be part of this, or we will be here again in three, four, five years. Again, maybe unfortunately sooner. The other point I would just make is the president asked DHS, he asked the men and women of DHS, what do you need to do your job? Congress and the American people have entrusted to you the security of our country. What is it that you need? The list that we have provided is what we need to do our mission that you asked us to do. It's not less than, it's not more than, it is what we need to close those loopholes to be able to protect our country. So I would just encourage everyone much more eloquently than I can describe all the reasons why we all, I think, here are committed to helping the DACA population. But to truly solve the problem, it's got to be in conjunction with border security. Jeff? I would just echo what my son here. For those of us who have been through comprehensive reform, that was six, seven months of every night negotiating uh, staff on weekends. And a lot of the things we're talking about on border security and some of the interior things have trade-offs. And we made those during that process. I don't see how we get there. Uh, before March 5th. Uh, so I think that's why we make it a phase two. We do a phase one, which is DACA and security. And we do phase two, which is comprehensive immigration. And I think we should go right to it. I really do. We do one, and we then do the other. But we go right to it. Yes. Mr. President, I, 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 I think it's important to thank you for your flexibility and your leadership. And, and so I think what all of us have to do is have the same willingness to have a little bit of flexibility to get this issue done. And obviously I want to do a lot more than DACA. But the urgent thing now, for obvious reasons, are these young men and women who we have to deal with first and foremost. And, and to Steny's point, there are two issues which we keep hearing that everybody agrees to. That is dealing with these individuals in a permanent real solution and border security. So I, I don't see why we shouldn't be able to do that. And I'm hoping that that would then lead us to, to Senator Cotton's point, of, there's a lot of lack of trust. If we can get real border security and deal with these, these individuals, we can get that done, then I think, my gosh, it all opens up to do a lot more things in the future for the American people. Mr. President, I just want to reemphasize what Secretary Nielsen said. Uh, it is so important that you understand when you talk about border security, if you apprehend somebody at the border, but then you cannot send them back outside the United States, even though they're unlawfully present in the United States, uh, you have not solved this problem because they're then released into the interior of the country and the problem persists. And that sends a message back to wherever they've come from. I agree, they Bob. come do it. You know what? We're going to negotiate that out. Absolutely. I agree, and I think a lot of people agree on both sides. Henry? Thank you, Mr. President. And, and I agree with uh, my good friend Mario in the sense that if we focus on DACA and border security, I think we can address this. Uh, issues of chain migration or the other issues, I think that should be looked at the second phase. But, but again, I said this with all due respect to both Democrats and Republicans, uh, but being from the border, I always get a kick out of people that go down, spend a few hours there. They think they know the border better than Cornyn or Martha, some of us there, because we've lived there all our life. Let, let, me, let me explain this. For example, if you, talk to, if you look at the latest DEA, if you're worried about drugs, look at the latest DEA report. More drugs come through the ports of entry than in between ports. But we're not even talking about ports of entry, number one. Our buildings. Our buildings. But, but no, no, I, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I'm just saying ports, let, let's, let's finish this. And, and some of us have been working this longer than some of the folks. Number one, if you look at the 11 or 12 million undocumented aliens, which is a second phase, 40% of them came through visa overstay. So you can put the most beautiful wall out there, it's not going to stop them there because they'll either come by plane, boat, or, 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 or vehicle itself. That's but, but, yes, and I know. So the other thing is, the other thing that we got to look at, the wall itself, Mr. President, you talk to your Border Patrol chief or the former Border Patrol chiefs, I've asked them, how much time does the wall buy you? They'll say a couple minutes or a few seconds. 
And this is our own Border Patrol chiefs that have said that. It's not mine. But, but mine is not clear the wall works. Oh, it's the not. The wall works. They say without the wall, we cannot have border security. Okay. Yeah. Let, let, let but all you have to do is ask Israel. Look what happened with them. Without the Henry, without the wall, you can't have border security. All right. Homeland appropriations. Uh, your chief was there, and the former chiefs have all said that. Now, the other well, thing is, it, it, <laughs> well, if, if you look at, this is where the walls, Mr. President, if you look at where the walls are at right now, this is where the activity is, where the walls are at right now. We have massive miles of area where people are pouring through. Now, one of the good things, because of our rhetoric or because of the perceived, you know, my perceived attitude, Fewer people are trying to come through. That's a great thing. Right. And that, therefore, I mean, our numbers have been fantastic, maybe for all the right reasons. But, but, but let me just finish my thought. Uh, the, the, uh, I want to ask you that we're playing, you saw the game last night. It was a good game last yes. night. We're playing defense on the one-yard line called the U.S. border. We spend over $18 billion a year on, on the border. If we think about playing defense on the 20-yard line, if you look at what Mexico has done, they stop thousands of people uh, on the southern border with Guatemala. We ought to be looking Henry, at working with We them. stopped them. We stopped them. You know why? Mexico told me, the president told me, everybody tells me, not as many people are coming through their southern border because they don't think they can get through our southern border, and therefore they don't come. That's what happened with Mexico. We did Mexico a tremendous favor. We actually put appropriations to help them with the southern the border. The point is, I know, we always give everybody. But Every other nation gets money but ours. But finally, We're always looking for money, but we give the money to other nations. But finally, the last point that we have to stop is, instead of playing defense on the Wagner line, if you look, this is your material, we know where the stash houses are at. We know where the hotels are at. We know where they are across the river. And we're going after why, them. Why stop? Why play defense on the one yard and line? We're going the, after them like never before. We're going after, after the stash is, houses. If we focus on DACA. We can work on the other things separately on sensible border security. Listen to the folks that are from the border. And, and you folks are going to have to hear one voice. You folks are going to have to come up with a solution. And if you do, I'm going to sign that solution. Yes. We have a lot of smart people in this room, really smart people. We have a lot of people that are good people, big hearts. They want to get it done. I think almost everybody, I, I can think of one or two I don't particularly like, but that's OK. <laughs> no, I think everybody. Look, Henry, everybody wants to sign away. I'm, I'm trying to figure that out. Uh, everybody wants a solution. You want it, Henry, yes, and I want it. I think we have a great group of people to sit down and get this done. In fact, when the media leaves, which I think should be probably pretty soon, <laughs> but, I, liked, but I, I will tell you, I liked opening it up to the media because I think they see more than anything else that we're all very much on a similar page, not the same page. And, Henry, I think we can really get something done. Yes, sir. So why don't we ask the media to leave? We appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. President, Mr. President, just to clarify, is there any, is there any agreement without the wall? Uh, no. There wouldn't be. The wall has to be there. Have to, you need it. John, you need the wall. I mean, it's, it's wonderful. I'd love not to build the wall, but you need the wall. And I will tell you this. The ICE officers and the Border Patrol agents, I had them just recently up. They say, if you don't have the wall, you know, in certain areas, obviously, that aren't protected by nature, if you don't have the wall, you cannot have security. You just can't have it. It doesn't work. And part of the problem we have is walls and fences that we currently have are in very bad shape. They're broken. We have to get them fixed or rebuilt. But, you know, you, you speak to the agents, and I spoke to all of them. I spoke, I lived with them. They endorsed me for president, which they've never done before, the Border Patrol agents and ICE. They both endorsed Trump, and they never did that before. And I have a great relationship with them. They say, sir, without the wall, security doesn't work. We're all wasting time. Now, that doesn't mean 2,000 miles of wall, because you just don't need that because of nature, because of mountains and rivers and lots of other things. But we need a certain portion of that border to have the wall. If we don't have it, you can never have security. Uh, you can never stop that portion of drugs that comes through that area. Yes, it comes through planes and lots of other ways and ships, but a lot of it comes through the southern border. You can never fix the situation without additional wall. And we have to fix 
existing wall that we already have. So you would not support what Senator Feinstein asked you, which would be a clean DACA bill that doesn't... No, I think a clean DACA bill to me is a DACA bill where we take care of the 800,000 people. They're actually not necessarily young people. Everyone talks about young. You know, they could be 40 years old, 41 years old, but they're also 16 years old. But I think, to me, a clean bill is a bill of DACA. We take care of them, and we also take care of security. That's very important. And I think the Democrats want security, too. I mean, we started off with Steny saying we want security also. Everybody wants security. And then we can go to comprehensive later on, and maybe that is a longer subject and a bigger subject, and I think we can get that done, too. But we'll get it done at a later date. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Mr. President, I'm Senator Hirona from Hawaii. Yes, As the only immigrant serving in the United States Senate right now, I would like nothing better than for us to get to comprehensive immigration reform. But what, I, what I'm hearing around the table right now is a commitment to resolving the DACA situation because there is a sense of urgency. Right. Now, you have put it out there that uh, that you want $18 billion for a wall or else there will be no DACA. Is that still your position? Yeah, I can build it for less, by the way. That you want. I must tell you, I'm looking at these prices. Somebody said 42 billion. This is like the uh, aircraft carrier. It started off at a billion and a half, and it's now at 18 billion. No, we can do it for less. We can do a great job. We can do a great wall, but you need the wall. And I'm now getting involved. I like to build under budget. Okay, I like to go <laughs> under budget ahead of schedule. There's no reason for seven years. Also, I heard the other day. Please don't do that to me. Seven <laughs> years to build a wall. We can build the wall in one year, yes, sir. We and we can build it for much less money than what they're talking about. And any excess funds, and we'll have a lot of, whether it's a woman rink or whether it's any, I build under budget, and I build ahead of schedule. There is no reason to ever mention seven years again, please. I heard that. I said, I said I wanted to come out with a major news conference, Tom, yesterday. No, it can go up quickly. It can go up effectively, and we can fix a lot of the areas right now that are really satisfactory if we renovate those walls and those things. Can you tell us how many miles of wall you're contemplating, whether it's 17 million or that? Or yeah, 13 million. we're doing a study of that right now. But there are large areas where you don't need a wall because you have a mountain and you have a river, or you have a violent river, and you don't need it. Okay. No, I think it's changed. I think my positions are going to be what the people in this room come up with. I am very much reliant on the people in this room. I know most of the people on both sides. I have a lot of respect for the people on both sides. And my what I approve is going to be very much reliant on what the people in this room come to me with. I have great confidence in the people. If they come to me with things that I'm not in love with, I'm going to do it because I respect them. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, can, can you beat Oprah, by the way? Yeah, I'll beat Oprah. Oprah would be a lot of fun. I know her very well. You know, I did one of her last shows. She had Donald Trump, this is before politics, her last week, and she had Donald Trump, and my family it was very nice. No, I like Oprah. I don't think she's going to run. But she can beat her. I don't think she's going to run. I know her very well. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But let's, let's wait about that for the press to meet. Yeah, it's phase two. I think comprehensive will be phase two. I, I think I really agree with Dick. I think we get the one thing done, and then we go into comprehensive the following day. Mr. President. I think it'll happen. Thank you. Thank you, Yes. Well, wait, we'll, we'll, we'll Let's wait one second. Thank you all very much. Thank you, sir. I hope we gave you enough material. This should cover you for about two weeks. <laughs> The President of the United States and an amazing nearly 45 minutes open to cameras from the cabinet meeting room there with a bipartisan group of senators and representatives talking immigration, the wall. The dreamers, children brought here illegally as children, now adults, what to do with these people, do you deport them? And talking about comprehensive immigration if you can just do one step at a time. You heard the president bring back deal making through earmarks. This was an amazing peel back, if you will, of the curtain. Uh, not to say that you haven't seen what we call video sprays of 
meetings like this before, but it generally is not this much of the back and forth among Republicans and Democrats. The president showing uh, himself not just as the deal maker, but the types of deals that can get done on the most important things that Americans say that they care about. At one point, just to give you a little color and texture in the room, uh, we couldn't see the faces, but we thought we heard Senator Lindsey Graham's voice. And we heard a call out to Senator Bob Menendez of New Jersey. Hey, I'm going by your office at 640. Let's do a steak dinner. Um, it was that sort of tone. And then there were moments uh, you saw Representative Henry Cuellar, a Democrat from Texas who got very upset. He had charts and, and information talking about what he wanted to see along the border and the billions of dollars during his time as a lawmaker that he's seen go toward things that didn't make life better. Joining me now is a person who knows the president very well and knows this deal maker side of him, Anthony Scaramucci, former White House communications director. Anthony, you have been sitting here as the news has been breaking, and I want you to share with the audience what your thoughts were as you were watching. Well, I mean, it, one of the things I said from the press podium that day that he announced my job was that I'd like the American people, Harris, to see the president the way I see him or the way Kellyanne sees him or Ivanka or Jared sees him as a deal maker. Uh, incredibly open-minded, uh, wants to find the seam there to get something done, make it efficient. Uh, I, I, I love the commentary about the Woman Rink. Uh, all of us here that live in New York know that he, he delivered the Woman Rink in three months. It took the city eight years. They couldn't get the thing finished. Um, and so he is a can-do person. Uh, and given all the nonsense that came out in the last seven or eight days, I think it's very refreshing and very smart of the White House communications team to open up a room like that to that level of dialogue so that you could think, see his critical thinking and the way he is as a human being. You know, one of the things that we get, and the public probably knows, we're getting these real-time responses and statements from lawmakers in a meeting like that. Their offices are in a room working, trying to put out the statements based on what was being said. Um, that was coming out staccato, as it always is, but what those sometimes lack is the tone. So when the president looks across that room and he recognizes Senator Dianne Feinstein, which I would imagine he doesn't have a whole lot politically where they're yoked and he says I want to hear from this person and he was going around trying to put people together uh, it was like a boardroom in that sense well that that's his natural talent I mean at the end of the day he's an entrepreneurial figure uh, I think one of the good things that's happening in Washington right now is that people are getting adjusted to his style and his tempo he's probably faster moving than the politician he's probably faster on the thinking than the average politician and he's going to cut a deal and that deal will be a successful deal for the American people and we can look at the last 365 days and see all the different things that have been done on the economy, things that have been done on national security, things that are he's working on now towards immigration and working on towards health care. Yeah. Uh, and you'll see have another very good year this year. You know, uh, there was a lot of question about how much the president would kind of lean in at the beginning of the year after tax reform. And it has been a very fast paced agenda. But but this is something different because what he's saying to the people in the room he has, we know he said to Republicans, he said, bring me something on health care. Bring me something on tax reform, I will sign it. But to say that to a bipartisan group, bring it to me. I trust, I have confidence in all of you. What is he telling the American people by showing he's, this he's, side of him? He's, he's showing the American people the kind of leader he is. He wants to break the fever of that great extremist and that great polarity in Washington. And he wants to do what the American people actually hired him slash elected him to do, which is to reach a consensus, uh, pull people together. Uh, he's a leader. He's not a follower. Uh, and he's telling them uh, straight up, this is what I think is necessary. This is what I think is needed. And hopefully they'll fall in line with him and he'll, he'll, he'll cut a good deal. You Paris. know, I've heard you say things like skin in the game. Yeah. And, and this is risky politically for the, for the president. Let's, let's break it real here. So because I, if it doesn't get done, yeah. right, that's, mm -hmm. that's risky for him. Yeah, but I, I mean, let's think in the more positive way. It's going to get done, but also he's a counterintuitive person. So uh, 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 the last couple of presidents, unfortunately, have sat on the side of either the red or the blue team. Uh, and I think the president's trying to do is mix it up a little bit, change the color to purple, uh, and see if he can get something done that the average American person will step back and look at it and say, okay, that's my president. That's my president working for me as opposed to a special interest or a lobbyist group or even his own party. And so What's, that's the reason why he's going to be so successful. I like the way you put it. Let's talk about teams. Because you know who wasn't in that room? Those big four. We, we, we didn't see Mitch McConnell 
and Paul Ryan and Nancy right. Pelosi and Chuck Schumer. So, so I'm not sure why that was, uh, but certainly. Uh, uh, but from Kevin a deal making standpoint, he said was there. these are the deal makers, and I've got all the participants on a piece of paper. Well, maybe here. that maybe that was specific to that immigration legislation, and maybe mm -hmm. um, they all felt it'd be better to just to go with whatever that committee was that's working on that specific legislation. Do you see a greater determination with this president uh, than when you worked in the White House? No, and I know it was a short guy, listen, stint. We'll, guy, we'll just call it what me, it is in the room. Full, give me full credit for the 11 days, though. I don't when right. they, <laughs> right. when they send But you've 10 known days, him a long time. It hurts my feelings. But but here's what I would say to you that uh, I've seen this intensity in him forever. I mean, and this is a 71 year old young person. Uh, doing this job. And so when people talk about uh, his aptitude and his skill set and his capabilities, uh, I've seen it firsthand. And I'm very happy that they're allowing the American people to see him in a room like that so that they can see it firsthand as well. You know, Anthony, uh, when we talked about bringing you on the program today, we, we were going to cover other issues. Then the news broke, and it's been great to get your perspective because you still have a relationship with this president. Uh, before you walk away from our set here on Outnumbered Overtime, I want to ask you about what's played out with Steve Bannon. Specifically, we'll leave the book out of it, specifically the relationship between a man whose vision uh, was shared, populism with the president. Does the president still get populism done?